So I'm going to talk about um, generative models inspired by physical uh, processes. I will take uh, two different perspectives. Um, one that's probably familiar to you, and the other one is uh, more recent. Then I will combine the two, essentially present them as uh, uh, from the spectrum um, uh, in the same uh, extremes of one uh, spectrum of models. And then, if time permits, I will uh, say something about common issues in these uh, processes. So, um, slides don't move. That's not good. Uh, all right. So, uh, today, generally, uh, AI is all the rage, uh, uh, totally exploding. Uh, so, it's uh, nearly impossible to summarize what's going on and all the possible applications uh, that people are considering for generative AI. I should uh, uh, qualify that, uh, to me, generative models mean probability models. So I'm uh, looking at distributional modeling. Generative AI doesn't need to necessarily be probabilistic. But uh, for the purposes of uh, this talk, it means uh, distributional uh, modeling. So since it's impossible to summarize everything that's going on, so if we narrow it down to uh, uh, our group and within a group uh, to molecular modeling, even there, uh, there's quite a bit of diversity of uh, uh, development of generative uh, models. So we've done uh, work on small molecule conformers, so uh, generative modeling of low energy configurations of uh, compounds, drug-like uh, compounds, um, trying to understand molecu molecular interactions, how a small molecule like a drug binds to a protein, and formulating that task in a distributional modeling way. So you are predicting a distribution of possible binding poses of the small molecule on the surface uh, of a protein. Uh, we work on uh, generating 3D structures of proteins, so generating new types of uh, macro uh, molecules, and that's one that I will touch on uh, today. We're also working on generating materials, which is in some sense much harder generative task than uh, small molecule uh, generation, since these are repeated uh, uh, crystal structures. So there's quite a bit of work on by us and others in a molecular context that will be one example that I will uh, focus on today. One question uh, you might ask is, where do these models uh, come from, generative uh, models? And one perspective you can take is, uh, that, uh, let's look at physical processes. They are sort of a natural and stable and maybe have natural flow uh, that can be turned into generative models. And in this context, I will take uh, two examples, as I uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, one, diffusion models that may be already familiar uh, to you. I elaborate uh, on those in the molecular context. Uh, diffusion models take an object that of interest to you, whether it's an image or a molecule, uh, as a process uh, noise, and then you learn to reverse that process. So the reverse process is the generative uh, trajectory, how you generate new uh, samples. The other perspective that I will talk about is from electrostatics. Uh, so you take a data distribution, uh, samples, you view those as a charge distribution. And if you look at now further and further away from that charge uh, distribution, it looks like a point mass. So you have a very simple field uh, far away. So you can sample from a very simple uh, distribution, follow the electric lines back to the data manifold, and that's your generative uh, trajectory. So you learn that uh, uh, to capture the e uh, electric uh, field. Now, there would be a more general perspective here, and a uh, physics student at MIT, Ziming uh, Liu, uh, has been trying to kind of systematize a little bit uh, how to derive generative models uh, from physical processes. So physical processes typically characterized by partial differential uh, equations, and there are some uh, listed uh, here um, as examples. Then there are challenges to turn those equations into density flows. And if you can do that, then you have a very small uh, path to an actual generative uh, model that you can uh, use. There's some sort of trickiness in this process, not all uh, uh, 
uh, density flows are appropriate for generative models. So for example, if you go from a data distribution, then as you flow the density, you should get to a distribution that's independent of the distribution that you started with so that you can actually sample and uh, then generate. Okay. I will not focus on this sort of a wrapper uh, architecture here today, but focus on the two examples uh, from uh, diffusion and uh, electrostatics. All right, so let's start uh, with the diffusion and develop that a little bit more in the uh, molecular context. So our work in, uh, in the context of mo molecules have uh, developed uh, new uh, diffusion models, uh, uh, for example, for this uh, molecular docking uh, problem, finding the binding pose uh, of a small molecule on the surface of a protein. Um, Another context is uh, uh, generating 3D structures of uh, macromolecules like uh, proteins, and that's the one that I will be focusing on uh, today. So our task is now to learn a generative model that can generate protein, new protein uh, molecules. All right, so let's uh, 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 see what could we do in the protein context? There are a variety of generative uh, tasks that you could uh, try to address. Uh, I will talk about backbone uh, design and elaborate on that shortly. Uh, you could also take the backbone and ask, what is the amino acid sequence, uh, generatively generate an amino acid sequence that would fold into that uh, 3D structure? Uh, you can screen uh, proteins, you can do conditional generation, given the properties that you want, you want to realize uh, specific uh, uh, molecules. So I will focus on the backbone uh, uh, design, so only focusing on the structure uh, of this macromolecule. All right, so let's see uh, how we could uh, sort of uh, frame or uh, formulate uh, this task. So if you look at the uh, protein sequence, uh, it has a repeated structure of alpha carbons connected to a nitrogen and another carbon, and that uh, part repeats uh, along the chain. Uh, alpha carbon is the one that the side chain attaches to that specifies the actual uh, amino acid in that residue uh, location. So you could uh, uh, realize protein structures by just essentially um, placing the alpha carbons in the right uh, locations that would uh, imply a particular structure. But it's a little bit coarse, and uh, um, even though you get the precise uh, atomic locations for the uh, carbons, you forget about the bonds and uh, other uh, local structures. You could uh, take a different view, uh, the same chain here. Now look at uh, uh, the bonds, and some bonds rotate, and others are uh, rigid. And look at just the rotatable bonds and uh, so-called torsion angles, and represent the protein structure in terms of just modifying those angles. The problem with this view is that uh, if you change one angle, then other things change potentially quite drastically. You get this kind of a lever effect. So it's not a very local uh, description of the structure. The one that we adopt here is uh, something called local frames. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, you specify the position of the alpha carbon, but also a local coordinate system that tells you how the uh, uh, chain is oriented at that location. So think of the protein structure as a collection of frames. Uh, collection of local uh, coordinate systems, okay? So that is the structure that we aim to generate as part of this work. All right, so if you give me a structure, then how do I uh, get the frame description uh, from that uh, structure? So uh, pick an alpha carbon, now uh, draw a vector from that uh, to the position of the nitrogen position, uh, of the other carbon, you get two vectors, you can orthogonalize, and you get this local coordinate system. So you get the position of the alpha carbon, and you get the local coordinate system, and that is a frame, and now you can extract those frames for all uh, residue positions in the structure. 
okay? So you give me a structure, I get the frame uh, representation then. Our task then is to how to learn to generate this collection of uh, frames as representations of protein structure. So here's just a, a recap. Uh, you have uh, the uh, local frame. Uh, protein is a sequence of frames, and you uh, collect them together. You get this uh, uh, protein structure. Uh, I don't, but I will I evaluate it. So uh, uh, the question was about the, how do I know that this is a stable uh, structure. Uh, if I give you a collection of frames, then obviously it would not be in general. Uh, so how do I know? And the evaluation of generative protein structures is a, a key question, and I will uh, address that later. All right. So now, how do we learn this uh, uh, collection of frames? And we use, uh, develop a diffusion uh, process for this. So what I need to show you then is to take this protein molecule, how do I add noise in you know, some a uh, formally meaningful way to define a diffusion process over the collection of uh, frames, and then I learn to reverse denoise, learn these denoising steps uh, to generate uh, a new protein uh, molecule. What I would want from this process uh, is that it's uh, rotationally uh, invariant as a distribution. So there's no inherent bias to generate uh, proteins of a certain rotation. So whatever I, uh, if you give me a protein uh, structure, then it has the same probability whether it's rotated uh, or not, okay? So it's rotationally invariant. Translation invariance we uh, achieve just by centering uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, alpha carbon uh, location. All right. So how do we uh, uh, define the first, define the forward process, so-called forward process, uh, adding noise in a, a meaningful way? And then how do we learn to reverse that uh, uh, process? OK, so if you take a single frame, uh, you can define a valid diffusion process uh, over that single frame by separating the location, the uh, translation, uh, the location of the alpha carbon uh, from the orientation uh, of that frame, okay? So uh, diffusion process over the location of the alpha carbon is a, a sort of a standard uh, Brownian uh, motion. You can define a perturbation kernel that uh, you can use to sample uh, from a particular location or a perturbed version of it by just uh, adding Gaussian knot. The rotation is a little bit more uh, difficult. Uh, there is a perturbation kernel, isotropic Gaussian on SO3. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated as a distribution. You can sample from it, and sampling uh, from it, this perturbation kernel essentially corresponds to picking a random direction, uniformly at random, and then rotating a little bit uh, along that uh, direction. It's the rotation angle that's a little bit delicate, what it should be, so that this is a, actually a valid uh, diffusion process. But you can sample from it uh, based on a truncated uh, series. Um, it's a little bit more detailed, uh, so I'm not going to address that here. Okay. So uh, now you have a diffusion process that takes a, a frame and diffuses that uh, um, into noise, so you get a Gaussian noise at one uh, end for their location and a uniform random uh, uh, rotation uh, uh, as well. All right, so this is just an illustration of how a structure is diffused according uh, to this into a random noise, okay? So this is the forward process. Now we need to figure out how to reverse this, how to learn the denoising steps uh, so that we can start from noise and then iteratively generate a sample which is a valid protein structure. All right, so this is a little bit more mathematically uh, written somewhat abstractly here. So you have a, a forward diffusion process over the collection of frame rotations, and then you have that I alluded to that we center uh, 
um, the proteins at every step, so it's a centered uh, diffusion process. So that's the forward process. Okay? So if, there were, uh, if the data distribution had no rotational uh, bias, and you push through that data distribution through this denoising uh, process, then at every step, uh, at the particular time point, the marginal distribution would be also rotationally invariant. So the question is about the connection of the frame. So do I actually maintain the uh, connection between the frames? Uh, right. So in the forward diffusion process, uh, there is no connection. Uh, in the reverse process, they can be architecturally connected. Since I know I'm a, a frame connected to you, so architecturally, when I'm doing the denoising, de uh, my neural representation of the reverse process uh, can make use of the chain structure uh, of the protein. But the forward process does not. Okay? So uh, since the marginal distributions now, are, uh, according to the forward process, as uh, SO3 invariant, then the score, sort of the gradients of the log probability that give you kind of a direction where you should move, they will be equivariant. So you rotate things, then the scores rotate uh, accordingly, okay? All right, so now this valid diffusion process has a reverse uh, process as well. So forward process takes you from a structure uh, to noise, and the reverse process takes you from noise back to samples of uh, the structure. So there is now a reverse process, and uh, it needs guidance, which is the score functions here that we need to learn, uh, sort of the directions in the tangent space uh, when we do geodesic approximate this uh, discreetly with a geodesic sampler uh, denoising steps, we apply these uh, score functions to give that uh, proper denoising uh, direction. So those are the things that we need to learn in order to be able to apply this reverse process. Once you give me the scores, I can do this geodesic sampling uh, back and realize the full protein structure. Okay? So how we learn this uh, is uh, uh, relatively uh, bare bones uh, architecture. And what it does actually is uh, it takes a noisy version of a collection of frames, now uh, with noise, and it tries to predict from that collection a clean structure, a full, uh, well-formed uh, um, collection of frames representing a protein, okay? So that's what the neural architecture at every step is trying to do. From that, we apply uh, to that predicted uh, collection of frames, we apply the perturbation kernel and then calculate what the score would be, appropriate direction to move uh, to work, okay? And the last function that we're trying to optimize here is the difference between score functions computed from predicted uh, clean versions versus actual uh, structures uh, as data sampling. And you're trying to statistically match uh, the two, okay? So uh, this is the denoising score matching uh, loss for diffusion processes. There are some auxiliary losses that are used, but this is the main guidance uh, that the model gets. All right, so now uh, we have a reverse process. Uh, we can learn uh, the score functions, and now we can actually test how well this uh, uh, works. And now back to the question that was asked uh, earlier, how do I know that this, uh, what I generate is at all valid? Since I have now a generative model over protein structures, uh, so it generates potentially protein structures uh, that you have not seen uh, in the database uh, at all, okay, is that valid? So what we, how we can evaluate these things is through self-consistency. So it's kind of a process to evaluate them uh, as well. So what we do is we start from noise, we sample uh, using this generative model uh, uh, potential protein structure, but that's just the backbone structure, uh, sort of the alpha carbon locations and the local frame, okay? Now, 
we're going to use another method to predict what are the residues, uh, residue identities, the amino acids that uh, would cause uh, that sequence to actually fold to the structure that I predicted. Okay, you can use a technique called uh, uh, or method called protein MPNN, protein message passing neural network that predicts that uh, amino acid sequence for any given protein structure that you uh, propose. Okay, once you have a sequence, you can now run a folding algorithm on that sequence. For, forget the structure that I predicted. Uh, apply a folding algorithm uh, to the sequence, and you get a structure back. Okay, so you have a starting structure that I proposed, uh, and structure that came out of the folding algorithm, and you can compare the two. And we say that uh, the structure that I proposed is designable if uh, there is little discrepancy between the starting and end structure. So what I propose uh, seemingly can be folded uh, into 3D structure corresponding to uh, that proposal. Okay? So it's a self-consistency uh, evaluation. So does it work at all? It actually works quite well. So uh, for relatively small protein uh, sequences of length, uh, say, from 1 to 300, a large fraction of the proposed structures are actually quite designable, meaning that their reconstruction is very close to the proposed uh, structure. Uh, typically, it's hard to reproduce variety of secondary structures uh, in these uh, um, samples that you generate. Uh, and the plot on the right here shows that you actually cover alpha helices and beta sheets uh, uh, in these generated samples. The larger the proteins become that you're trying to generate, uh, the more helices it, uh, they tend to have according to this plot. All right, um, this is just an example uh, illustration of uh, two examples that uh, uh, you might uh, want to look uh, more carefully into. They are structures that are highly designable, meaning that there's a very little discrepancy between proposed and reconstructed structures. And as structures, when you align them to anything that you see in the database, they're quite distinct. So there are novel structures that seem to be stable uh, as candidate protein structures. And these are just examples, one shorter, one uh, longer. Uh, you see three things uh, displayed here in each row. Uh, the left one is the proposed structure, the middle one is the reconstructed structure, and then the last one is an alignment to the closest structure in the database. So you see that there is quite a bit of discrepancy between what's in the database and what the structure was that uh, we proposed. All right, so it actually works quite well. Defining this uh, principled forward process and learning to reverse it actually works quite well uh, for generating protein structure. Here are uh, some examples of uh, how it uh, generates uh, from noise uh, those axial structures. All right. So now, if you really want to solve the applied problem, so uh, uh, not only have an uh, unconditional distribution of our protein structures, but also condition it uh, in various ways, so you have to resort to pre-training, use additional data uh, to make these predictions uh, even stronger. And uh, one sort of uh, pre-training is... Uh, folding uh, uh, algorithm. So yeah, you can look at the sequence and the corresponding structure as data uh, and uh, realize a folding method from sequence to structure and use it as a pre-training initialization for your diffusion model. Okay? And that is uh, Rosetta fold uh, diffusion uh, and just to argue that it's actually meaningful to use it as an initialization, the Rosetta Fold folding algorithm takes as input already a collection of frames, produces as output a collection of uh, frames. The input frames in the folding algorithm are evolutionarily related 
uh, structures to the sequence that's uh, given to you, and the output is that clean structure. So it has kind of a architecturally already a uh, correspondence with the diffusion models that take a noisy collection of frames and predict the clean version. Okay, so you might suspect that this uh, uh, might actually be possible to use as a pre-training one. A little bit uh, more, uh, the losses that they use in training the algorithms are also related. Uh, the folding algorithm uses something called frame-aligned point error. So you take an each frame uh, that you predict, you align it to the correct, corresponding correct frame uh, in the actual structure, and that may cause some deviations of uh, atomic positions elsewhere. And you kind of average out uh, the errors um, in those uh, positions. We use uh, uh, denoising score matching uh, that actually shares the same minimum if you get the correct one, uh, correct structure, uh, then both of these losses are minimized. Obviously, the gradients go in slightly different uh, directions. All right, so uh, what we do now is uh, uh, a series. You pre-train a folding algorithm, then you fine-tune it as a diffusion model, operate uh, in this diffusion framework. That's now the neural network that uh, solves the uh, sampling problem. There are all kinds of engineering reasons why you might fiddle with the actual losses that you use for uh, fine-tuning. I won't get into those uh, right now. I'm happy to answer later. Now, once you have trained this, uh, then you sample in the same way as you sample a diffusion model. Start with the noise, uh, predict the clean structure, uh, calculate the score, which is now the direction uh, in the tension space, do your one geodesic sample, and you iterate to uh, generate the actual structure. All right, so um, uh, does this work, or is this uh, additional diffusion fine-tuning actually necessary at all? Why wouldn't we just use the folding algorithm that seems to have structurally similar thing directly uh, um, uh, as a sampler uh, of valid protein structures? Well, it sort of works uh, out of the box, the folding algorithm, um, but uh, deteriorate, deteriorates fast as the size of the protein uh, increases. So uh, the vertical axis here is, again, the self-consistency discrepancy between uh, starting and then uh, structure. All right, and uh, I'm going to go over this very uh, uh, briefly. Uh, what this shows is that for small, relatively small proteins, the diffusion model alone, uh, the orange um, blocks here works quite well, we, uh, almost as well as their uh, combination. As their protein uh, size increases, then the pre-training really starts kicking in and helps you maintain uh, correct structural integrity. Now, there are a number of different things that you can now do. You have a very uh, good sampler for uh, protein structures. You can do binder generation, guide the uh, sampling of structures to have a particular, say, protein-protein interaction bias. Um, uh, this is just an illustration uh, of sampling such a uh, binder uh, region for a protein. You can do motif scaffolding. That means that you have, say, an enzymatic uh, motif. You want to wrap it in a very small, therapeutically meaningful uh, protein to hold that motif uh, in place. And these methods allow you to now sample the surrounding structure that holds that motif uh, in place. Or even generate symmetric, larger symmetric uh, oligomers, uh, things that are composed of multiple different uh, Change, and these were actually uh, um, experimentally validated by David Baker's lab. All right, so uh, there are a number of uh, tasks that you can uh, use this uh, for. All right, so that's a, a trajectory uh, for uh, one physics-inspired uh, model in the context of uh, mo molecular modeling. 
Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and uh, take a different perspective to physics-inspired uh, generative models and then tie these things uh, together. So I'm going to start from electrostatics um, and the context in which I'm uh, illustrating uh, these models is now image uh, generation. Uh, in principle, applicable also to molecular modeling, but uh, this is the context in which we develop. So this is just an illustration of how image generation quality has uh, evolved uh, over just the past few years. This is a uh, uh, relatively small data set, but still quite uh, diverse. If I uh, turn, this is an FID score that uh, measures uh, as you sample an image from your model, you take a real image, you embed both of them with a pre-trained model into a vector representation and uh, have a Gaussian approximation to the statistics of those and then have a Wasserstein two distance between the two. So when the uh, data set that you generate from your model looks exactly in terms of those statistics as the real data set, uh, then this uh, distance will be zero, okay? So there's quite a bit of evolution in terms of those FID scores over just a, a few years. Starting from uh, GAN, Generative Adversarial Networks, uh, moving to Diffusion, and the circled one at the end uh, that I will talk about as this uh, electrostatic uh, um, model, or inspired uh, by electrostatic. All right, so just a little bit more uh, on the evaluation of this. Uh, this is a syn sort of synthetic evaluation, the FID score. Um, you might not think that it actually corresponds to human evaluation, and it sort of relates, but not perfectly. Uh, this is a figure extracted from a recent uh, paper that evaluates, does a human evaluation of different methods uh, of whether humans can tell apart whether it's a real image or a, a synthetically generated image. So um, the axis here, the vertical uh, axis is human error rate, so you want to be very high up there. Um, the axis on the horizontal side uh, goes from high FID score to low FID score, so you want to be uh, far in the right. And the method that I'm going to be talking about here is in that uh, top corner here. So it seemingly generates uh, images that uh, hum humans cannot tell apart uh, from real images. All right, so what is this electrostatic view? So uh, let's take a um, data distribution uh, interpreted as a charge uh, density. Uh, so uh, data point is now a point charge uh, in this view. Then you embed that data distribution in one higher dimensional space, okay? So now the data distribution uh, lies in this picture on the 2D, uh, 2D manifold, and you uh, introduce an extra uh, coordinate. And now you can define an electric uh, field over this uh, ambient space. And the further you move uh, away, the more the data looks like a point charge and you create a very uniform uh, flux uh, over a large uh, hemisphere, okay? So there's actually now a bijection between a uniform, uh, any point on the large hemisphere and any point in the data uh, manifold. So you can sample from a uniform distribution over the large hemisphere and follow the electric lines that do not cross back to uh, the data manifold, okay? So this is just an illustration, an actual illustration of as you are sampling uh, from this large hemisphere and go towards the data dis uh, distribution along the electric lines, how the images change uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this generative trajectory. All right. So how do we actually learn this? So um, uh, this is just a, a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, the data distribution is uh, in that lower dimensional uh, manifold. Uh, electric field over the ambient space, um, you can get by integrating over the data distribution uh, with this uh, uh, kernel uh, here. 
and the subscript X here is just the uh, image coordinates of that electric field. So electric field now has coordinates also for the uh, extra dimension that uh, I introduced. The generative flows, you can take that extra uh, dimension now as a parameter in these curves that you follow, okay? And then the flow is uh, just a ratio of the vector valued electric field over the image coordinates uh, divided by the, um, the electric field uh, value for the uh, additional coordinates. All right, so now you don't have a full uh, density, you have uh, samples, um, so you can get only an approximate uh, electric field, and you learn a neural network to reconstitute the electric field. And notice that you don't actually need uh, to worry about the overall scaling. Electric field has a very high dynamic range from very high value to very low value, but you actually can normalize them since the flow that you are interested in uh, does not depend on the overall uh, scaling. So when, uh, how you learn this in the simple uh, way, you sample a mini badge, uh, you calculate an approximate electric field over the ambient space, and any point here, likely points that you would visit in a generative trajectory, X and Z, uh, X is the image coordinate, Z is the additional one, uh, you learn to reconstitute a normalized electric field. Okay. And at the time this was introduced, it actually got the um, state-of-the-art uh, FIB score um, on this uh, CIFA-10 data set. All right, so that's not exactly the point uh, that I was referring to earlier, uh, where we wish to get to, so we're going to generalize this uh, a little bit further. And as a motivation uh, of why we need this generalization, let's look at this uh, plot here. So diffusion models, uh, if you recall, uh, take an object, add noise, um, and then learn to uh, re uh, regenerate through denoising steps. They have a very strict relationship between the norm of the example at any point in time or at any noise uh, level, okay? Uh, because the noise is uh, high dimensional, so the norm of the examples uh, are uh, almost precisely tight uh, to the overall noise level at that uh, point. This is much more flexible uh, in terms of the Poisson uh, uh, flow models that I described uh, earlier. As a result, a simpler architecture actually allows us to do better uh, with the Poisson flow uh, view rather than the diffusion view. But since these are quite uh, distinct in terms of their characteristics, Perhaps there is a way to combine these, uh, get the benefits of both, okay? So how do we uh, get there? So on the left here, you just see what I uh, told you uh, earlier. You uh, augment the uh, data with the one additional dimension, calculate the electric field, uh, follow the um, electric lines back to the data manifold. What we do now is uh, introduce not one, but multiple extra dimensions. So you embed uh, data, not in n plus one, but n plus d dimensional space, okay? Uh, data still lies on the, uh, all these additional coordinates equal to zero, uh, hyperplane, and you can calculate the electric uh, field. Now it has a symmetry here because the only thing that matters from the extra uh, dimensions is their norm, so the electric, uh, you can write the electric field only as a function of the uh, image coordinates and this norm of these extra dimensions. And the only difference you see here in the calculation is that there is a n plus d rather than n plus one here in realizing the electric uh, field. You still get uh, bijection uh, as before if you take out this symmetry and you uh, get flow back to the data manifold in a similar way if you take the norm of the extra dimensions as the parameter uh, specifying the uh, generative trajectory. All right, so how do we uh, learn that? Uh, we have a revised uh, uh, method for learning that looks very similar to um, uh, flow matching or 
uh, denoising score uh, matching. So what you do is you sample a single data point uh, here, which is a single point charge, okay? You draw uh, uh, R, the norm of the additional coordinates from some distribution. This is very analogous to drawing a noise uh, level in a diffusion uh, process. And then you apply a perturbation kernel to the example. Uh, seemingly very related uh, way to diffusion models. It uh, uh, adds noise and you can sample a noisy version of an example. Here you can also sample a perturbed version of the example at uh, um, conditioned on the radius of this uh, additional coordinate. This is very related to a green function here, um, but you can think of it as a perturbation uh, kernel here. Okay, and then you minimize uh, essentially a flow matching um, uh, criterion. You can think of this target here uh, just as a target of the electric field in a normalized electric field uh, corresponding to a point charge. Okay. So this is the neural network that tries to learn uh, to reconstitute this electric field. Okay, and I'm just introducing a simpler uh, single point sample version of the criterion, learning criterion uh, for uh, getting an electric field representation up to a, a normalization. Okay, so the minimizer here is the same uh, one as before. If you said D equals to one, uh, then you reconstitute the previous uh, electric uh, uh, field. So the reason for doing this is an interesting one. If I now scale this, uh, take a particular limit uh, of this, holding the ratio of the norm of the additional coordinates and the dimensionality, the square root of the dimensionality constant, call it the noise level, then this actually turns into a diffusion process. So uh, the perturbation kernel turns into a Gaussian, the flow matching uh, criterion here turns to denoising score matching, okay? So what I've done here is now actually represented uh, uh, Poisson flow models, the simple one with one extra dimension, and uh, diffusion models uh, where the ambient space is now actually infinite dimensional along the same spectrum. So they're in some sense very related models, and I could choose anything in between. And what changes is really the uh, characteristic of the field. What I can control now with this extra dimension is the shape of the electric field that I'm learning to uh, reconstruct, okay? So it will have an effect of how well I uh, do. So uh, this is just uh, maybe uh, uh, too detailed uh, of a plot. The only thing I'm gonna say here is that uh, A, you get state-of-the-art uh, performance on variety, variety of image generation tasks, and two, the best performing models is not D equals one, the original uh, Poisson flow model, not D equals infinity, which would be a diffusion model, but somewhere in between, okay? All right. So now uh, we started with uh, two different perspectives to uh, uh, generative models inspired by uh, physical considerations, uh, diffusion and uh, uh, electrostatics, connected the two so that they're actually in the same uh, family of models. Um, if I have a few minutes, I'm going to uh, then talk a little bit about common issues uh, with this, uh, uh, both of these models. So these are essentially continuous processes, right? Diffusion is a continuous process, and if, uh, in principle, you would want a continuous process backwards, so is the Poisson flow reconstruction a continuous process, okay? So there's a question of how do we sample along these continuous trajectories and how that affects uh, the quality, and uh, as well as efficiency. So here's just a contrast. Uh, um, the initial diffusion models uh, uh, proposed not long ago uh, actually uh, used 1,000 uh, steps to generate. So imagine now an uh, uh, image goes into the neural model, 
and you get a refined uh, output, and you do that 1,000 times before you generate a single image. Okay? So there's a kind of a big efficiency uh, issue there. Modern architectures now use only uh, a few tens of uh, iterations. Okay? But there is now a quality issue. If you have a continuous trajectory, you're trying to approximate it with a very small number of uh, steps. So you get uh, discretization errors, for sure, uh, along these uh, trajectories. You also have errors from the score functions that you have learned. Okay? They point in a slightly different direction. The neural reconstruction isn't perfect, so it may lead you to uh, um, uh, wrong directions. So how do we understand uh, and maybe even improve on this uh, sampling once the model has already been trained? Okay, so here's a comparison of uh, uh, two different uh, types of samplers. Uh, ordinary differential equation, uh, in the context of diffusion models, you randomize once, then uh, you follow an ordinary differential equation until t equals zero, which is your uh, realized sample. SDE, stochastic differential equation, uh, so you take a step, you add noise, take a step, uh, add noise, so it's a stochastic version of this trajectory. Okay? In terms of quality and the number of steps or number of function evaluations as I have uh, here on the x uh, axis, these have a very different characteristic. If you are willing to take many steps, then the stochastic di uh, differential equation actually gets you to a higher quality sample. Okay? Uh, one reason is that it actually starts uh, uh, smoothening uh, out the errors in your score functions. Discretizes and errors are um, less uh, relevant. When you are trying to push it uh, to generate samples only with very few uh, function evaluations, the ordinary differential equations are actually uh, better. They lead to a higher quality uh, sample. So can we actually understand why this is? Uh, and can we propose something that's uh, um, even better than uh, either one of these? And what we proposed is something called the re uh, restart sampler, which is a very simple sample, uh, sampler. It starts with noise, follows the ordinary differential equation uh, uh, until t min, so close to the uh, n, then adds quite a bit of noise and then follows the ODE uh, again, and you can repeat this large uh, noise step. Okay? That actually has a much better trade-off in terms of the number of function evaluations and um, uh, the quality of the samples uh, that you generate. All right, so let's uh, very briefly, uh, I'm going to uh, kind of run through the... Uh, Intuition of the uh, analysis here to show that you can actually show why uh, uh, these um, uh, qualitative uh, features arise. So let's look at just the ODE uh, sampler uh, and two time points. These are now the time points where uh, T min is where you add noise and you add enough noise that essentially gets uh, you back to a noise level corresponding to T max. So that's the interval I'm looking at. Now, uh, at T min, you can compare what your sampler gets as a distribution compared to the true uh, answer that you're after. You can do the same thing at uh, T max uh, using total variation distance rather than Wasserstein 1, but this is, uh, in the theory, it's uh, comparative across the sampler, so it doesn't matter that the measure is different here. All right. So what you can show then uh, is that the uh, Wasserstein distance is bounded by uh, at the T min, so close to the end. Uh, it's bounded by how far off you were at the high odd, makes sense, plus terms that uh, relate to discretization error, uh, delta. Delta is smaller the more steps you uh, take, as well as errors related uh, to the errors in the score function uh, itself. So how well your neural model was able to uh, reconstitute um, uh, the score. Now, if I do the same thing for SDE, 
I get uh, uh, two, different, uh, two differences here. Number one, the discretization error is considerably larger because you take stochastic steps. Uh, the error in the discretization, you need a, a smaller uh, step. So it's a square root of delta, much worse than the ODA. But you also get a contraction effect that this added noise starts actually uh, connecting the distributions. If you started from a different one, uh, high up, and you follow the process, you're actually contracting that error a little bit because of the noise that you uh, added, okay? So this actually now explains qualitatively how these two samplers uh, behave. When you take a very small number of steps, the discretization error dominates, the ODE sampler is much better because SDE has much higher discretization error. When you take a large number of uh, steps, then the contraction uh, gives you the benefit. So SDE will eventually get uh, to a better answer. Now, the restart sampler uh, that I uh, proposed actually has a better contraction uh, because of this larger noise that uh, you added. Um, it has a similar level of discretization error as the ODE sampler because most of the time you are actually following the ODE trajectory. But there's a linearly accumulating uh, term here from the number of restart steps that you perform before you actually generate the sample. All right, so this is just to show that the qualitative pictures that I show, uh, showed you earlier, if you take a state-of-the-art uh, ODE, SDE, and then the restart uh, sampler actually hold uh, uh, exactly I, as I illustra illustrated uh, earlier, whether you're talking about CFR10 or MNSNAP. Uh. All right, so just uh, last thing, uh, a few examples here. This is a, a stable diffusion. You are generating sample in response to a text prompt. Uh, you get an image. And you can see it lacks a little bit uh, finer details here. If you do a restart step here, you actually start getting more details uh, in this image. Um, it performs better. The second restart step uh, may add even more details. But if you continue this further, you would slowly start uh, degrading the quality. Okay. All right, so uh, with that, uh, what I've told you uh, here is that uh, um, you can get nice uh, diffusion processes over molecular structures uh, by properly defining the forward process and learning to reverse that. Uh, you get benefit from pre-training when you uh, extend that to larger proteins or conditional training. Uh, I showed you how uh, Diffusion processes and Poisson flow models are actually two ends of the same spectrum, uh, and the best performing models are somewhere uh, in between. And that there's still some things to do in terms of uh, perfecting these uh, generative models in terms of the sampling trajectories by understanding a little bit better how the errors accumulate when we generate samples from complex generative models. All right, with that, uh, I'm happy to take questions.